Pevni, the Ratem Nessa Vesir that can yet gun a prevenny dog are coronavirus to Galor a prevenny dog in Nadi that can yet Mark Drakeford. Jacobaur, uh, Sawes, be for a drug yard, your Senate heavy when Delio Gadar, that Brogia die Muya Puisig and Anamatep e coronavirus. Bell Arver, Father and Conhoir, just your life do with Arav. Am Lidaniaid a virus, but of an duidari ar trevniadai provi ac olrain, sid an athweddol wrth ni symud allan o gyfnod clo. But of an tynnu silwr senedd at o reoliadau sydd angen i ni wneud er mwyn gweithredu reolau ynysu i deithwyr wrth garaidd ffiniau'r dynas unedig. But of an trafod ar effaith y virus ar plant a phobl ifanc yng Nghymru. Ac yn olaf, byddai fy'n gyfeirio at y digwyddiadau erchyl yn yr uno dyliaethau ar wythnos diweddau. A llawydd, as in previous weeks, I will focus my report on matters not to be covered in the statements which follow from the Minister for Economy, Transport and North Wales and the Minister for International Relations and the Welsh Language. I saw the number of new cases of the virus in Wales continues to fall, as does the number of admissions to hospital and to critical care. There were 42 new cases reported by Public Health Wales yesterday. There are now 40 patients in critical care beds in Wales suffering from coronavirus, down from a peak of 164 in April. The number of new admissions for coronavirus has fallen from over 1,000 a week at the peak to 710 last week. These trends are encouraging, and I once again thank people in Wales for the commitment and solidarity that they have shown over the past weeks and months. Despite that, however, yesterday the ONS reported that in all settings, up to the 29th of May, there have been a total of 2,240 deaths involving coronavirus in Wales. The number of deaths reported yesterday by Public Health Wales was nine, continuing the downward trend. But each of those is an individual with a life that could have been led. Each one will have been greatly missed. And it remains imperative that we all continue to follow the rules to protect ourselves and others. So, as I reported last week on the decisions taken as part of the latest review of the regulations to ease some of the restrictions currently in place, we will make further easements as soon as it is safe, as soon as it is safe to do so, but only when it is safe to do so. We have taken these cautious steps, supported by our test, trace and protect system, which came into effect last week. As I've said, the number of positive cases of coronavirus in Wales continues to fall. Last week, the highest number on any one day was 82, the lowest 35. These cases generated 651 people for follow-up by the contact tracing teams. And of that 651, 619 have already been successfully contacted and advised. Uh, our system in Wales is a partnership between Public Health Wales, local health boards and local authorities. Over 600 staff experienced in working with the public have been recruited and trained by local authorities and other public services. Not all will be undertaking contact tracing work as yet due to the low number of new positive cases, but the capacity is there to step up if needed. And careful arrangements have been made in our system to protect personal data and to guard against fraud. And all of that is important because this is a trust-based system enabled by technology and staffed by local people. It will provide the essential infrastructure to help us prevent transmission of the virus and gradually reduce the restrictions on day-to-day -day life in Wales. So we have to be prepared for a potential upturn in transmission because as the lockdown eases, so the number of personal contacts increases. In that context, we have reviewed the evidence on the role of face coverings, and the Minister for Health and Social Services reported on new advice yesterday, endorsing the use of non-medical face coverings on public transport. 
The Minister also provided a written statement yesterday which set out that we are on track to complete the first phase of testing all residents and staff in care homes in Wales by the end of this week. And we will now test all care home workers each week for a further four week period. So with the UK government's plans for quarantine requirements at the border came into effect this week. Border security is a reserved matter, but because the quarantine arrangements are implemented through public health legislation, it was necessary for the Welsh ministers to make parallel regulations for Wales. Where people notify an intention to quarantine at an address in Wales, they will be contacted by Public Health Wales. So within previous statements, I have considered the impact of the virus on the work of the Welsh Government on its budget and other areas. The legislative programme is no exception, with a sharp reduction in the capacity of the Government to bring forward our proposals and challenges indeed for the Legislature in discharging the responsibility to scrutinise those plans in current circumstances. The Education Minister's statement yesterday informed ministers that, very reluctantly, the government has concluded that it will not be practicable to proceed as planned with the Tertiary Education Reform Bill. It will now be published as a draft bill for consultation. I will make a statement next month on the government's legislative plans for the remainder of this Senate term. So with yesterday, we received important evidence on how coronavirus is impacting the lives of children in Wales. This has been an extraordinary period for us all. But for children, the coronavirus crisis will make up a significant proportion of their whole lives. Attending to their needs and experience is an important strand in our response to the emergency. Over 23,700 children and young people aged between 3 and 18 shared their views through the Coronavirus and Me survey. This survey is a partnership between the Welsh Government, the Children's Commissioner for Wales, Children in Wales and the Youth Parliament. The survey underlined how much young people have been missing their family and friends during this period. And for young people in particular, it has underlined their anxieties about their education and worries about falling behind. As our Chief Medical Officer has regularly made clear, there is more than one form of harm from coronavirus. Children's needs must be a real concern as we try to balance the benefits of protection from the virus against the harms caused by loss of education and social contact. And there's no doubt that those harms will impact most on those who are already disadvantaged. From the start, we set out to mitigate those harms by keeping schools open for children, receiving free school meals and children of key workers. But for many children, there has been no contact with school and their experience of remote learning may have been mixed. That is why in considering the options for the remainder of this term, the Minister for Education has given priority to ensuring that all pupils will meet their teacher in small groups to support them with their learning and planning for the next stage. The Minister's statement last week confirmed that this is a phased return to school. It will start on the 29th of June and continue until the end of July, ensuring a full month of schooling in its new format for all four pupils before the summer break. Finally, Llywydd, the leader of Plaid Cymru raised the question of Black Lives Matter protests with me and I was grateful to him for doing so. The anger felt at the death of George Floyd has quite rightly cast a spotlight on the wider experience of black people in our society. We have as great a need as any here in Wales to confront our own history, to recognise the part played in it by black communities and to address the systematic discrimination and discrimination faced still by black people today. Nobody's record on this is perfect. No political party, no organization, public or private, and no government. All I want to say to black citizens here in Wales today is that, imperfect as the record has been, the Welsh government is here to stand by you, 
to work with you, to learn from you as we recommit to making a real difference in the future. How is Diop and Vaur? Adam Price, or Wynedd Plaid Cymru. Rwy'n gwneud o rwy'n Chris Howey yn fawr eich synwadau ar ddiwedd eich datganiad ac hoffwn i ddychwelyd at y cwestiwn o oblygiadau i ni yng Nghymru o'r digwyddiadau erch eich yn ddiwedd ar yr unol daleithiau. Mae pwy ydyn ni'n coffau o'r gorffennol yn adlyw eich chi yn gwerthoedd ni heddiw fel cymdeithas. Fyddai fe'n briodol felly yn eich tîm chi brifunidog i gynnal adolygiad y drwy Gymru gyfan fel sydd yn digwydd nawr a draws Llinden i sicrhau nad yn ni mewn unrhyw fodd yn cael yn gweld yn dathlu caethwasiaeth, trefedigaethedd neu hiliaeth yn ein cofebau cenedlaethol neu lleol. Tywydd i'ch yn fawr i Erin Price unwaith eto am codi i'r pwnc pwysig. A dwi'n cytuno yn llwyr gyda beth wedodd e. A mae'n pwysig i ni cofio ein gorffennol. Ac ar ran oedd Cymru wedi rhoi i fewn i'r pethau ni'n feddwl amdano heddiw. Ond dydyn ni ddim yn eisiau dathlu pethau. Ni'n eisiau cofio a ddysgu, ond nid i dathlu. Dyna pam ni yn gweithio gyda'r yr awdodau lleol a pobl eraill yng Nghymru i weld. Os mae pethau sydd dal yn dani ar hyn o bryd sy'n ble mae'r amgieithau yw y lle gorau i roi pethau i fod yn rhan o'n ein hanes ni ac i Paid i'r anghofio yn hanes, ond nid i ddallu pethau. A ni'n dal i gweithio gyda bobl eraill a ledled Cymru i feddwl am hwnna. The way we teach our history has the capacity to either reproduce the past or change the future. And so, first minister, in addition to the general commitment you gave in your statement, which is very welcome, I was uh, wondering if you would be better to give uh, two further specific uh, commitments uh, today. Um, the Welsh Government currently funds uh, a woollen maritime slate uh, and coal museum, even one for the, the Roman Legion. Uh, and there's also a proposal separately uh, for a mil military medicine uh, museum in what uh, was uh, Tiger Bay. There is an obvious gap. So would you commit, uh, First Minister, to exploring the establishment of a national museum telling the history of the BAME communities in Wales? And would you also uh, commit to embedding anti-racism and the teaching of black and people of colour history, including, uh, as you yourself have uh, 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 referenced, Wales' own role in colonialism and slavery as core elements within the educational curriculum in every school in Wales. Well, thank uh, Alan Price uh, again. He's right to point to the wide range of museums that we have in Wales, including a new uh, football museum as a result of an agreement between uh, his party and uh, the government earlier in this uh, Senedd term. Uh, I'm very happy to look at uh, a museum of the sort he describes. I'd, I'd really want it to be a living museum. Uh, I've had the privilege of a number of occasions in recent times of uh, helping award uh, recognition to young people from the Black community as part of Black History Month. And the, the message I try and uh, convey to them in that event is that they are creating their history today. Uh, the history doesn't belong to the past. History is something we are all engaged in, in producing ourselves and that they have agency themselves as hugely talented and valued young uh, black people here in Wales. So uh, I'm very happy to commit to looking at it, but I, I do very much want it to be uh, part of celebrating contemporary Wales, the contribution of the black communities 
make the way that, that they shape Wales uh, into the future, as well as looking at uh, their experience in shaping uh, Wales in the past. Uh, and as far as teaching in schools is concerned, uh, Adam Price will be very aware uh, of how recent events have shone a spotlight on this whole subject. Uh, I know that my colleague Kirsty Williams will be wanting to work again with those who have been uh, advising us on the new curriculum, on the way that it is to be uh, developed uh, and delivered to make sure that we are capturing the lessons of the past few weeks. I think this is a matter for every school uh, in Wales, uh, whatever the local makeup of a population uh, might be. Uh, it is just as important that uh, children where black communities have been less present to understand that history as it is for young people who are part of that community themselves. Paul Davis, sir, when the Ruth played. First Minister, earlier this week you indicated that you were looking at easing some of the lockdown restrictions in Wales in your next review. And the people of Wales will be looking for hope in that uh, statement, hope that they can reunite with families, hope in relation to their businesses, and hope that as the number of new cases is falling, some of the freedoms that have been taken away in recent weeks will now be restored. I appreciate that you're still working with officials, but you have previously indicated in the past that uh, hairdressers and others should start preparing for reopening. However, there are other sectors that are yet to hear anything from the Welsh Government, such as the property industry, the retail motor industry, and the list goes uh, on. Therefore, in preparation for your next announcement, can you confirm on what fundamental basis the Welsh Government may ease restrictions for some sectors? And what steps are you taking to ensure that that criteria is fairly tested against all sectors so that Wales's economy can start to reopen a bit more in the coming weeks? Uh, well, so it, uh, uh, I share that hope that people in Wales have that we will be in a position at the end of next week uh, to further lift some of the restrictions we've all had to abide uh, by over what is now nearly three months. Uh, how will we know uh, whether it is possible to do so? Uh, well, it will depend upon the level of circulation of the virus here in Wales. And there are a range of indications that we will be able to use to tell us whether or not we have headroom to be able to offer further uh, restrictions, uh, further um, amelioration of those restrictions. The R number uh, will be one indication, but some of the things that I covered in my statement, uh, so is, uh, will also be relevant. So to, to give you a different uh, so yardstick, um, in answer to the leader of the opposition's question. Um, when we went into lockdown at the end of March, uh, there were 400 new confirmed cases of coronavirus in Wales on any one day, and that number was rising. Seven weeks ago, when we first began to lift some restrictions, that number had fallen to around 100 a day and was falling, and that helped to create the headroom to begin uh, the process. Uh, as we go into this week, the figure is around 50 new confirmed cases every day, and that number continues to fall. Uh, so your chances of meeting somebody uh, as you leave your own home who is suffering from coronavirus is about an eighth of it was uh, when we went into lockdown. Uh, and that's just a way of trying to explain to people why it is possible to offer people uh, additional freedoms. But the second thing that we will continue to have to emphasize to people is that as they exercise those freedoms, they have to exercise them really carefully. Because even if there are only 15 new confirmed cases a day, you have no way of knowing as you leave your home whether you are going to be in contact with one of those 50 people. So social distancing, hand hygiene, use of face uh, coverings, non-medical face coverings on public transport, all those are things that we must still use even as we lift the lockdown, to go on making sure that we bear down on the virus, we create more headroom, so at the end of another three-week period, there are further things that we would be able to do to help resume life as we were more used to it before the virus began. Well, I hope, First Minister, 
that as the Welsh Government considers the next major changes to its COVID-19 policies, it will work constructively with opposition parties and it might be helpful in future if you could consult opposition politicians before making some of these decisions so that the people of Wales can be sure that we as politicians are working together where we can in the public interest. Now, First Minister, last weekend you made it clear that Wales will remain largely shut over the summer with visitors likely to be restricted to staying in cottages and self-catering flats. As I'm sure you can imagine, your comments were met with some anger and frustration by some tourism operators across the country who understandably fear that this could lead to the collapse of the Welsh tourism sector. Now, I appreciate that opening up the sector has to be done in a safe and sustainable manner, but as our tourism businesses watch their counterparts across the UK consider ways in which they can partially reopen tourist facilities, many operators feel as though they're being left behind with no hope for their businesses in the future. So will you and your government take the opportunity today to spell out exactly what the Welsh Government's current plans are for the tourism industry here in Wales? And can you also tell us what discussions you've had with representatives of the tourism industry to ascertain how your government can better support them throughout this pandemic? And will you commit to providing further support to, to tourist operators across Wales until they can reopen to, to ensure their viability for the future? Well, Sawyer, uh, let me say that the future of the uh, tourism industry is very much uh, in my thoughts and in the work that we do within the Welsh Government. I absolutely appreciate uh, what an enormous impact the virus has had on that sector here uh, in Wales. Uh, I wanted to give an indication that there is some hope for that sector too, uh, that there are some ways in which we might yet be able to resume some tourism activity during the current season, but it will have to be, as Paul Davis has rightly uh, said, with safety at the forefront uh, of our thinking. Uh, we have very regular contact with tourism organisations and interests uh, in Wales. I had a meeting uh, only yesterday with a minister responsible, with senior officials here reporting on uh, those conversations and thinking ahead to what we might be able to offer uh, in terms of lifting the lockdown. Uh, it is, if it is possible, uh, then beginning with self-contained accommodation where people are not sharing uh, kitchens and toilets and showers and so on, uh, seems to be uh, a sensible and safe way of thinking about how we can resume activity in the tourism uh, industry. The other key factor and Mr. Davis will be very well uh, aware of this, I know from his local representation, is that it has to be done with community consent. Uh, he will know the level of anxiety there has been in parts of Southwest and Northwest Wales during the pandemic uh, of people coming in to those areas from places where the virus has been in more virulent circulation and the risk of the virus coming into places where it's been in low circulation and the impact that that could have on local uh, services and local lives. So there's a job of work for the industry uh, to do as well uh, in having those conversations with local populations. Many of those people work in the tourism uh, sector themselves. So that as we move, if we are able to, uh, to allow tourism to resume in Wales, that people who travel to those communities uh, can be sure that they will be welcome uh, and that uh, the industry will once again be demonstrating to people everything that Wales has to offer. Mark Reckless. First Minister, we, we no longer have First Minister's questions. Uh, instead, I respond again once remotely to your statement. The Westminster Parliament has returned, uh, but elected members aren't allowed to attend the Senate. Yet on Saturday, a mass of protesters were allowed to demonstrate at the Senate, in sight of where your health minister had his takeaway family picnic. I asked you then if you'd read Animal Farm, as it seemed some were more equal than others. This week, as others were fined for traveling a bit more than five miles to see family, at least one Labour member joined the protest in Butte Park. 
why should others obey the lockdown if Labour members who impose it break it? Mandy Jones from my group rightly observed, if this second protest goes ahead, this is a slap in the face to those who have sacrificed so much in order to defeat the virus. When asked your view on the protests, did you take the opportunity to condemn their illegality? Did you warn protesters they could be fined or say you would support the police in issuing such fines? No, you chose instead to condemn the elected member who sought to uphold the law. Of course, a mass protest organized incidentally Lewis, by a group which wants to dismantle capitalism and defund the police is a slap in the face to many who have sacrificed so much in order to defeat the virus. First Minister, will you apologize to Mandy Jones for your disgraceful slur in attempting to link that turn of phrase to a police officer seemingly killing a man by kneeling on his neck for eight and a half minutes? Why won't you enforce your rules without fear or favor? Is it because you support the protests or is it because you're afraid that you will be cancelled by the protesters, as Jenny Rathbone and Ali Ahmed were on Saturday when they respectively spoke up for other minority groups and said all lives matter. First Minister, as you won't enforce your laws fairly, isn't it time we repealed them? Uh, so is, uh, how this parliament chooses to sit is not a matter for me. Uh, if this parliament decides that it wants to resume meeting uh, partly or wholly in person, then I will appear in front of the Senate to answer questions. It's entirely a matter for you, not a matter for me. Uh, as far as uh, the point the member made about lawmakers, let me be clear. Uh, my view has always been that you cannot make the law and break the law. Uh, and that goes for us all, every single member, in my view. Uh, we have the enormous privilege uh, of making decisions, which we then ask other people to abide by. We cannot make those decisions, ask them to abide by it and not abide by it uh, ourselves. And that goes for us all. Uh, so with, I very much support the police uh, in the way that they have responded to demonstrations. Uh, it's not for me. Uh, to instruct them who have to make those decisions on the front line as how they shall respond to the circumstances unfolding in front of them. Uh, I think police in Wales have responded uh, in a constructive uh, way to the difficult position they have faced and I want to support them uh, in the actions they have taken. Uh, as for demonstrators, I simply say again uh, that I understand and share the anger that they feel uh, and their need to make their views known. But there are other and better ways to do that in the current circumstances. Uh, people should not gather uh, when they are in close proximity with one another and in violation of the rules that we have set down. There are many other ways in which views can be known uh, and need to be known and ought to be known. And I urge people in Wales who feel so strongly uh, as I do myself, to make those views known in ways that do not put themselves and others at risk. And for the avoidance of any doubt, this parliament is sitting. David Rees. Yeah, fair word. Uh, First Minister, we've literally received a notification from Albert Heaney the minutes of the guidance that may be changing for care homes and visits to care homes. I received constituents' uh, concerns regarding the ability to visit relatives in care homes who may be suffering with dementia. And the, there are some exa excellent examples. Sunomo in Abravan actually uses video contact in video at FaceTime. They go around to every resident to ensure every member of their family has a chance to see them. That's not possible in all care homes. Now, the guidance that's just, the letter that's just come out gives us indication that they seek uh, comments from the public and guidance will be published in the coming weeks. But your review is scheduled for next week. Uh, can you give us indication as to whether there will be opportunities for care homes, which are COVID free, to actually allow visits from families, particularly to members who have dementia, who see a friendly family face as crucial to their mental well-being? 
uh, it part, as part of your thinking and those guidance. Uh, sorry, thank you, Rhys, uh, for that. And you know, just to say again, you know, I hugely appreciate the human cost that there is for families and for residents in not being able to see uh, one another at times in their lives where that human contact means so much to them. But Mr. Rees referred to uh, care homes in Wales where there is no COVID in circulation. And three quarters of all the care homes in Wales have not reported a single confirmed case. But there are only two ways really in which coronavirus could get into a home where there is no coronavirus at the moment. One is it is brought in by a member of staff and the second it is brought in by a visitor. Uh, so the rules that we have had in place are absolutely there to protect care home residents from the devastating effect which coronavirus can have in a home which has elderly people with underlying uh, health conditions living in close proximity to one another. And week after week, Chloe, in these sessions, uh, we have had to stare at those very, very sobering figures of the number of people who have died in care homes uh, in Wales. Uh, so Mr Heaney's uh, letter, which went out on the 5th of uh, June, does uh, advise care homes about how they can do more to allow visits from family and friends to care home residents in circumstances which minimises that risk. Uh, and care homes are able to do that under the current regulations. It doesn't require a change in regulations to be able to do the additional things that Albert Heaney is uh, advising. And as David Rees said, there are many, many care homes in Wales who are already doing hugely imaginative uh, things to try and breach uh, bridge the gap between what was possible before and what has been possible during uh, the pandemic. Uh, we have a group working on that further guidance. It meets again uh, tomorrow. Uh, we want to be able to do more uh, to allow families to have contact with people in care homes, but we can only judge it uh, against the real risk, the risk we have seen from the number of deaths that have taken place of what the virus does if it does get into a care home where up until now all those efforts have succeeded in keeping it at bay. Llyr Griffith. Dear Llywydd, um, First Minister, the, uh, the cause to protect people's right to breathe clean air has clearly intensified during recent months and uh, I'm sure you'll share my concern that the Havod landfill site near Exxon caught fire uh, a fortnight ago. Uh, thick black plumes of smoke passed over uh, the large neighbouring communities. Uh, communities, by the way, of course, who'd fought a vigorous campaign some years ago to prevent waste being dumped there. Uh, now, as with the recent fire at nearby Kronospan, mobile air quality monitoring equipment had to be moved in from Swansea, uh, and that took days to arrive. Uh, arguably the worst of the damage had already been done, uh, but within two hours of its arrival, the equipment actually detected particulates above the acceptable, acceptable levels, uh, and residents were told to stay indoors with windows shut uh, for three days. Uh, and we know, of course, that burning plastics and other waste creates dioxins and furans, chemicals that can uh, accumulate in the food chain, and of course they can cause cancer as well. Now, hundreds of people have signed a petition saying that enough is enough, and they want to see uh, the Havot tip Close. So will, will you, as First Minister, ensure that an independent inquiry is held uh, into the cause of the fire and that the Harvard landfill site is closed, or at least is closed until uh, the inquiry is concluded? Uh, and will the government also now ensure that we have mobile air quality monitoring equipment located here in North Wales uh, so that we don't have to wait days on end for it to arrive uh, for any future incidents, by which time, of course, most of the damage has already been done? Uh, well, so is, there are authorities that have responsibilities in this area, the local authority, the fire authority, they will be providing reports on the events to which T. Griffith uh, has uh, referred, uh, and the Welsh Government will consider those reports and then decide what further action uh, may be needed. Uh, I, I, I take the point he made in his final sentence about the availability of mobile air quality. Uh, equipment and I will look to see 
uh, whether there is anything that can be done to improve that position. Mark Isherwood. Um, how do you respond to yesterday's statement by the British Association of Private Dentistry Wales, which has grown from not to 400 members in under a week, that many patients are suffering need needlessly, urgent action to deliver routine dentistry under interim standard operating procedures and PPE is required to allow the Welsh population the same care as in England, but more importantly around the world, and that many dental practices will not otherwise survive. And how do you respond to the following, which Wrexham Glyndor University has asked me to raise here? Quote, substantial numbers of staff and students are from across the nearby border with England. We're concerned about the current divergence at this early stage of emerging from lockdown and the confusion this may cause if it persists into later stages. How will we be able to communicate clearly to staff and students who may be anxious about being in breach? Uh, what I will I respond to uh, the first group by referring them to the advice of the Chief Dental Officer for Wales, who is the person best equipped, uh, a good deal better equipped than the member will be, uh, to provide people with expert advice in the dental or field and the continuing discussions that she will have uh, with the profession in Wales. That's how decisions should be made, uh, by proper professional discussion and professional leadership, and I refer them to the leader of their profession here uh, in Wales. Uh, as to the points made uh, by staff at Glyndu University, uh, I would be very pleased to uh, recruit and co-opt them into the efforts which we make as a Welsh government uh, to make clear what the rules are uh, here in Wales uh, and to put right any confusion caused by his colleagues across our border. Don Bowden. Yeah, Diolch Llewyd. And first, Minister, can I uh, welcome the fact that the last review of the COVID regulations, the Welsh Government were able to ensure that apprentices can return uh, to college in order to complete their practical studies and therefore uh, complete their qualifications. That's great news for those young people and we hope, of course, will benefit the uh, economy too. However, I do fear the scale of problems that could face young people in the months ahead. And in my own constituency, the Youth Unemployment Claimant Count is currently running at about 11%. So do you agree that in seeking to address this in the longer term, we should scale up on existing successes like the Aspire programme at Merthyr College and perhaps look to see if this apprenticeship model could be applied in more sectors and beyond STEM students, benefiting young people and local employers in a wider variety of settings? Uh, so I thank John Bowden uh, for that. And we were very glad to be able to support the FE sector in their wish to enable young people with practical examinations to complete those so that they weren't disadvantaged compared to young people receiving more conventional academic qualifications who'd already been catered for here uh, in Wales. Uh, thank uh, John Bowden for drawing attention to the success of the Aspire scheme. Uh, as she will know, it's an example of a shared apprenticeship. Uh, scheme where young people get an opportunity to gain experience in a variety of different settings and where small employers uh, in particular who may not have the capacity to take on a whole apprentice full time are still able to have the benefit of an apprentice working as part of their workforce uh, and uh, Chloe Dom's uh, suggestion was to build on success and to spread it further she will know that the Aspire scheme began in Blaina Gwent where we've got 80 uh, young people working as part of the Aspire scheme there and was then moved to, uh, to take place in Merthyr uh, as well. And I think that's a very good practical example of exactly the point Don Bowden was making. It was a success. We're doing more of it. We've extended the funding for it in Merthyr and Blaina Gwent for another uh, 12 months. And as we move into the difficult days ahead, uh, where unemployment is going to be increasing, and the impact we know that that has on young people's lives, then building on the things that we've done already and know uh, can succeed would be a very, very important part of our armory. Lina Piorwerth. 
Diolch Maria, ond llywydd i ddechrau. Wrth nos yn oldio ni'n galw ar lywodraeth Cymru i wneud ar gymhelliad i bobl wisgo gorchuddion wyneb mewn rhai sefyll faedd a sy'n gydweud i ddechrau mod i ynddalch bod y llywodraeth rhywun wedi gweithredu ar hynny. Ond eisiau, mynd ar ôl materion deintyddiaeth a Covid-19 ydw i. Dwi wedi cael nifer o ddeintyddion am cysylltu efo fi'n dilyn cyhoeddiad yn ni na sut mae gwasanaethau deintyddol yn mynd i fod yn cael eu hadfer yng Nghymru. Mi oedd un yn gefnogol iawn i'r ffaith bod yr adferiad hwn nhw'n mynd i fod yn ymraddol iawn. Yn pwysleisio'r risg gwirianeddol sydd na o heintiad mewn sefyllfa ddeintyddol, mwyr yn dweud bod Lloegr yn ei cyhoeddiad diweddar nhw ar wasanaethau ddeintyddol wedi dal i fyny efo Cymru o ran ail gyflwyno'r rhai gwasanaethau oedd eisoes yn cael eu gwneud yma. Ond mae'n rhaid dweud na pryder oedd gan y rhan fwyaf ohonyn nhw. Pryder bod Cymru i weld yn dilyn trywydd llawer ar afach i ail gyflwyno gwasanaethau na'r rhan fwyaf o wledydd yn sicr yn edrych drwy Ewrop. Pryder y byddai peidio gallu gwneud rhai trymiaethau mor sylfaenol a fillings ag ati yn golygu bod gwaith ataliol allweddol yn methu a digwydd ar effaith andwyol a llyn i gael ar iechyd deintyddol y boblogaeth. Er i llyn pwyntio allan bod deintyddiaeth fel proffesiwn wedi hen arfer gweithio efo risgiau cross-infection Cymlaeth. Mae nhw hefyd yn poeni bod y prif... Cwestiwn, plis, ffrin y bioorwerth, cwestiwn. ...fyddoli at gwestiwn yn sydd rhywun. Wedi defnyddio'r cyfle mae'n wneud newidiadau contracta dyn tyddol a dyma meddwl mae dyma'r amser i wneud hwnnw. Felly, gai ofyn i'r prif wneudog, ydy'n clywed y pryderon hynny, ac ydy'n barod i weithio efo y proffesiwn i chwilio am ffordd wahanol ymlaen. Wedi i ddweud i ddechrau llawydd, wrth cwrs ni'n awyddus fel llywodraeth i weld fwy o gwasanaethau yn y maes sylfaenol i tyfu. A mae hwnna'n wir am y maes dyntyddiaeth wrth cwrs, ond mae o raid i ni wneud e mewn ffordd sy'n gallu o falu am pobl sy'n gweithio yn y maes ac am cleifion ymlaen a hefyd. A bydd yr un ap i olwyr dwi'n siŵr yn ymwybodol ar ôl clywed oddi wrth o bobl, mae'n heriol yn y maes na. It's quite impossible to practice dentistry at a two meter distance and the use of aerosols, which is an intrinsic part of dental practice, poses particular risks when it comes to this virus. So we are keen, of course, to see dentistry uh, resume, as with other primary care uh, services. But it's got to be done in a way that protects the health of workers and of uh, patients. That's what the advice of the chief dental officer was designed uh, to deliver in a phased, uh, you know, re, um, refused resum a re phased resumption uh, of dental practice. She remains in close conversation with the profession. If it is safe to do more, more quickly, that is exactly what we would want uh, to see. But the word safe has to mean something. Uh, and it has to mean something that we can all rely on. Otherwise, patients won't come. Uh, that's why it's in the interest of uh, the profession to make sure that they can confidently communicate to patients that the services they will be offering have been approved by the leaders of their profession as being ones that it is now safe to resume. Janet Finch Saunders. Yeah, Llawydd. The chair of Care Forum Wales has publicly criticised Public Health Wales for not engaging with care professionals before implementing the new 28-day COVID-free policy restrictions. This could potentially close a half of the care homes in Wales due to the financial implications of this and the voids. Could you explain, First Minister, why those in our care sector were not consulted prior to the issuing of, of this letter? Also, not all COVID-19 test results are being received in the vital 48 hours window, some taking up to three days. What effect will this have on the new policy of weekly care home testing? As of 1st of June, only 22 of 68 homes had been mass tested locally. So how can we be confident that all homes now will reach that milestone of mass testing? And more so, how you're going to carry out the retesting weekly in our care homes? And finally, will you urgently review the impact of 1,400 discharges to care homes in 
prompt out just got charges to care homes in March and April and the effect that that has on our infection rates, given that some of those were not tested before they left hospital. Jochenbel. Well, sorry, the answer to the member's first question is to be found in her final question. Uh, the reason that we are proposing uh, that someone who has tested positive should not be discharged to a care home for 28 days is precisely because of the concerns raised by the sector uh, of people earlier in the progress of the pandemic being released from hospital to a care home uh, and having a risk of bringing coronavirus with them. Uh, our latest position is designed to make sure that that does not happen. Uh, now, you can't have it both ways here. Either you don't want people with coronavirus uh, to be in care homes, uh, or you don't. Uh, if you don't, then the 28-day uh, rule is designed to deliver uh, on that uh, objective. And we remain in close conversation uh, with the sector uh, all the time. Uh, so we are confident that we will have completed our uh, testing of care home residents and of care home staff uh, by the 12th of June. It has been a most enormous uh, effort. Uh, there have been instances in Wales where we've had to work very hard to persuade care homes uh, of the advantage of this policy. Uh, and I understand that there will be care homes that are anxious about outsiders coming into the home because of the risk of the virus uh, coming with them. Uh, but we've had quite a number of care homes where a lot of conversation has had to be had in order to allow the testing uh, to take place. And that has delayed the testing in quite a number uh, of instances. Uh, I, I see the member shaking her head uh, at me. I'm simply telling her the facts. Uh, I don't know what there is to disagree with them. That is simply a matter that is reported to us by health boards uh, and testers, that not all care homes are equally receptive and not all care home residents are willing to be tested. Uh, and that is a right that they have. It is not a compulsory system. It is an offer. And not all care home residents have wanted to take that offer uh, up. And we have to respect that too. Uh, we are confident that we can uh, now test every care home worker uh, weekly for four weeks. Uh, and we will see what we learn uh, from that. And then we will make a decision about uh, a proportionate approach to testing in the sector once that four-week period is over. Here we're Anka Davis. Jörg um, Good morning, First Minister. Last night, I was one of many people who took part in a UK-wide discussion on the Cooperative Party's new report, Owning the Future, on how we can rebuild cooperatively after coronavirus. And the report found that only one in 10 people feel that the UK wide economy before coronavirus prioritised sharing wealth fairly. And that seven out of 10 people think that the coronavirus recovery should give communities more of a say in how businesses and the economy are run. And again, seven out of 10 want to keep that renewed sense of community, which we found during the crisis. Now, in Wales, we're fortunate we've long had a government which understands and supports cooperative principles and has acted upon these year after year after year. But all of us in the Welsh Labour and Cooperative Group of members of the Senate would ask you, First Minister, will you continue to put those cooperative principles into action as we rebuild from coronavirus to grow our collective <coughs> stake in owning our own future in Wales, as well as right across the UK? Uh, so can I thank you, Anka Davis, for that question, drawing attention to the very important Owning the Future uh, report, which I've enjoyed reading. And it, it has that outstanding merit of the cooperative uh, movement, which is that it has a whole series of practical proposals at the end. It is not just a report that analyzes the problem. Uh, it's a report that then gives you seven, as it happens in this case, seven intensely practical ways in which you can help to shape the future, as the report uh, suggests. And I'm not in the least surprised at that finding in the report, because people in Wales have done so much cooperatively together over the past three months. So it is no wonder that they want a greater collective and 
uh, cooperative approach to shaping uh, that future. And the things we've done as a government over the years have always seemed to me to be with the grain of the way the people in Wales think about these matters. So I'm absolutely happy to recommit to continuing to do that over the rest of this assembly term as we begin to move uh, out of and hopefully beyond uh, the pandemic. Looking forward uh, very much to being part myself of the Wales Co-op Party Annual Conference uh, held virtually over the coming uh, weekend and an opportunity to discuss there practical ways in which we can work together to shape a future in which we all have a stake and the contributions of all Welsh citizens are properly valued and celebrated. Neil Hamilton. Neil Hamilton. Uh. Carry on. I'll come back to you. Lynn Eagle. Thank you, Claire Wes. First Minister, um, I entirely share your concerns uh, expressed in your statement about the impact of COVID on children and young people. But as I only have a minute today, I wanted to use my time to ask about another group who are all too often voiceless. Figures released last week by ONS have shown a staggering 83% increase in deaths from dementia, not COVID, in April. And the Alzheimer's Society has warned that the pandemic is taking a devastating toll on those living with dementia. Many of us in this assembly are proud to be dementia friends, and we know from that how vital uh, the uh, human contact is to those living with dementia um, who won't have to live in the moment much of the time. Now you've talked many times about the need to balance mental health with physical health considerations. You've said it again now in response to uh, David Rees. But can I ask how you've specifically taken into account the devastating impact of isolation and separation from loved ones on those living with dementia in the decisions you've taken. And I'd also like to ask you for your firm commitment today that you will urgently look at the numbers of deaths of those um, living with dementia and the associated Alzheimer's research. And for your commitment that you will issue a further written statement uh, detailing what further actions the Welsh Government will take to mitigate the impact of COVID on those living with dementia. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Lynn Eagle for that important question in a very complex and challenging uh, area. Um, the visits that we've been able to uh, talk about in care homes and set out in uh, Mr Heaney's letter uh, require social distancing to be maintained. Uh, and as uh, Lynn Eagle will know, that can be particularly difficult to explain to people who, as she said, live in uh, the moment and where physical contact is often very much part of the way in which they gain comfort from people who come to, to see them. And if we know that that physical uh, contact could pose such a, a significant risk to them and then to other people living in that same setting. So these are very complex uh, matters. The ONS figures are very uh, concerning and we will certainly be trying to make sense of them here uh, in Wales. In doing so we will rely I'm sure on the advice of our dementia oversight implementation and impact uh, group which comprises of people uh, looking after people with uh, dementia, the lived experience of that, the Alzheimer's Society, our own health and social care uh, organisations. It's due to meet uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, it will be looking at that report, at what uh, the Alzheimer's Society itself has said, as well as uh, ONS, and will be giving us uh, further advice. And uh, as we are able to use uh, that advice to advise others, then I will certainly make sure uh, that that is properly communicated to Assembly members. Nick Ramsey. 
Uh, Dioch uh, Llawydd, and um, uh, two issues, if I may, uh, First Minister. Uh, firstly, uh, I wonder if the Welsh Government could look again at this five-mile uh, travel rule and provide uh, and provide guidance on this. I know you've said previously um, that it is guidance and discretionary on, on people uh, on how far they do travel, but I, I've got many constituents who are still unclear and very concerned that they can't travel uh, to, to see family and friends, so, so could we have clarity on that? Uh, secondly, uh, I asked the Finance Minister recently if there'd been any discussions about uh, future raising of taxes in Wales uh, to, uh, to to deal with COVID recovery. I know she said that that was uh, not an attractive thing to do, but I wondered if there had been any discussions. And as we come out of lockdown, could the Welsh Government perhaps uh, look overseas at examples of some other countries in terms of getting the economy moving and using the tax system to do that? Uh, in New Zealand, for instance, uh, they've introduced a tax loss carryback regime to help businesses offset current tax losses against previous years. Uh, perhaps that's something that uh, yourself, UK government, um, could, could discuss. They're also introducing discretionary deductions for non-domestic uh, buildings to try and uh, support businesses and get the economy moving. So I think the Welsh Government does have a number of, of tools in the toolbox, as, as you and, and your predecessor have said before. So could you look at ways to use the tax system to really kickstart the economy and try to get Wales moving again? Uh, so I thank uh, Nick Ramsey for both of those questions. Uh, let me just say uh, once again, it is not helpful to refer to the five mile uh, limit as a rule. It is not a rule. If it was a rule, it would be in regulations. It's not in regulations. It is guidance to give people a sense of what the regulation that requires people to stay local might mean in their circumstances. And the best advice is just to say to people that they're to use the five mile limit as a rule of thumb are uh, there to interpret it sensibly and soberly in their own circumstances, because there are many, many different geographies uh, in Wales. And then, so long as they can demonstrate that they are acting uh, in a way that can be defended, then they will have brought themselves within the stay local rule. Um, there are no uh, plans for tax raising uh, by the Welsh Government during the current uh, financial year. Uh, I'm interested to uh, hear the examples that Nick Ramsey referred to. Uh, we tended to uh, gather a lot of information from countries elsewhere about how they are lifting lockdown regulations and the impact that that's having in the health uh, area. It's a useful point that the member makes about learning from uh, places elsewhere as they use different levers to assist the economy as the economy recovers from the impact of uh, coronavirus as well. Uh, I think most of the examples Nick Ramsey referred to would be for the UK government uh, to take forward. And currently, of course, in the non-domestic rates uh, context, then there are uh, a, a great deal of help has already been provided in the current financial year. Uh, so the businesses don't uh, face those obligations at a time when their ability to raise revenue uh, is at a low ebb. Uh, but I take the general point, and it's an important point, just as we learn from the experience of other countries in the health aspect of the coronavirus uh, crisis, it's important we learn from them in the uh, economy recovery uh, as well, and we will certainly aim to do that as a government in Wales. Neil Hamilton. Uh, wait one second for your microphone to come on. Can I have Neil Hamilton's microphone switched on? Okay, we're still struggling on that one. Um, I will I will call you Neil Hamilton uh, if we manage to get the microphone switched on. Um, I'll go to Nick Alan Davis. Thank you very much, and I'm grateful. Uh, presiding officer to the First Minister for the clarity of his statement um, this morning. I think uh, the clarity with which he's spoken is uh, something of a comparison with the continuing chaos that we're seeing across the border in England, where we see promises made, promises broken. We're seeing poor leadership and, and collapsing public support in the policies being pursued by the UK government and the horrific mortality rates we've seen across the border are, I think, 
uh, the, the main reason for that, as well as the inability of the UK government to speak clearly to the needs of their population. Uh, and I, I'm interested, First Minister, in the way that you are approaching future policy and the approach that you're taking over these coming months. You've spoken already about the decisions that you will be taking in the next week or so um, at the next review. But in the same way as um, Nick Ramsey spoke about international examples, I would like to understand the sorts of international examples you are looking at and considering in terms of how you approach a continuing lockdown. Now, we've heard some siren voices and sometimes strident voices from conservatives and elsewhere saying that you should just follow the disaster in England. Uh, but, uh, but nobody wants that. People in Planet Gwent don't want that. What they want is for you to consider their needs, to put people before profit, and they want you to consider their families and their communities. So I'd be grateful, First Minister, if you could um, outline to us the approach you're taking, how you're using international examples to inform that approach, and what you expect to be able to do as we move forward through these summer months. Uh, sorry, thank Alan Davis. I'll try very briefly to just offer uh, a few strands in the way we are trying to do what he uh, says. Uh, our approach in Wales has been to try to work out how a policy could be implemented and then to announce the policy, not to announce the policy first and then worry about how you can make it happen uh, afterwards. And we have seen across our border where that uh, leads you to in their education travails uh, of this week. Uh, we are determined to try to make sure that we take into account the messages we learn from people in Wales as we make uh, our decisions. That's why uh, at the end of the last three week review, we used the headroom we had to deal with the human heartbreak of not being able to meet uh, people from another household who are important to you. Uh, that came directly from the messages that we were hearing from uh, Senate members, uh, but also directly from people themselves and making sure that people's views and their preferences are plugged in is part of the way we will uh, make those decisions. Uh, I think of it in you know, the decisions we've got to make immediately and how we can plan over the period from now to uh, the autumn. And then there is the work that Jeremy Miles uh, is leading about longer term uh, recovery. In both of those things, evidence from other places in the world is really important uh, to us. We're learning a lot about the way lockdown is being lifted elsewhere and the risks uh, that are then inevitably run of the R number rising and the virus being in circulation uh, again. And uh, I know that Alan Davis will have read of those examples in other parts of the world, just as we learn from places that have taken uh, steps that don't result uh, in that outcome. And then in the way that Nick Ramsey said, we also need to learn the lessons of elsewhere about economic recovery, about ways in which we can create a fair economy of the future in which we reward those people who do the work that we really depend uh, upon uh, rather than those people who, in the way that we've seen over the last decade, have been able to use their advantages to create still more advantages while leaving the rest of us behind. Jane Bryant. Members of the cross-party group on preventing child sexual abuse are concerned about children subject to sexual abuse during lockdown. Two particular concerns about where a child is locked down and with the perpetrator, as well as an increase in online abuse, as children spend more time online and abusers exploit this opportunity. All of this is compounded by the fact children on child protection plans for child sexual abuse are underrepresented, so are more likely to be invisible before the pandemic. Can the Welsh Government ensure that the public and professionals know that the services there to support children and young people are still open for business? Helplines remain open, specialist services can, where safe and appropriate, support children and young people virtually, and the sexual assault referral centres are open and continuing to take self and professional referrals. And what more can the Welsh Government do to shine a light on this now and as we move into different stages of lockdown in the future? 
So if, can I endorse the central message that Jane Bryan passed uh, there, that the services that are there to protect children in these circumstances are there and are open and can be used. They may be operating in different uh, ways to make sure that people are safe, but they are there and they are operating. And if you have concerns and need those concerns to be raised, please don't think that because of the pandemic, there aren't ways for you uh, to do it. Uh, the good news uh, is uh, that safeguarding referrals to those services, which were suppressed in the uh, stay home part uh, of the lockdown experience, have recovered steadily in recent weeks. And they're now more or less back to uh, the levels you would have expected in times when COVID-19 wasn't part of our experience. So I think we can take a bit of heart from that, uh, that the public's willingness and ability to report concerns has returned to the levels we would have seen uh, previously. Reopening schools for all pupils to have a chance to speak to adults outside uh, the home, uh, trusted individuals in their teachers, is another very important part uh, of all of this and one of the reasons why we were keen to make the decision uh, that we did. Uh, we know that where schools have been open, then vulnerable young people have been more likely to go to that school if that school is their own school than if they're being asked to go to a school with which they are not familiar, a journey they don't know, teachers they, they haven't met. By reopening all schools, then those vulnerable children will be able to go to a place where they know already, are more likely to feel confident, talking to people who are familiar uh, to them, and if there are concerns uh, which need to be pursued, then the services are there now to make sure that that can happen. Neil Hamilton. Welcome, Barbara Clarif. Uh, the OECD is forecasting today that Britain will suffer the worst economic damage of any country in the developed world as a result of a draconian lockdown. We're forecast to see a 11.5% fall in our national income for this year. Uh, that compares with 6.5% in Sweden, which has followed a completely different road. We are taking an economic sledgehammer to crack a health crisis nut because the death rate in this country from coronavirus is 602 uh, per million, whereas in Sweden it's only two-thirds of that at 467 per million. Uh, so uh, we see in, in Britain a wholly disproportionate response to the health crisis. Meanwhile, does he understand, uh, the First Minister understand, that uh, hardworking and law-abiding citizens wonder why they're being kept locked down, even uh, can't go to church, or even for private prayer, because uh, such uh, events are, are, are banned. Meanwhile, left-wing hooligans are allowed to run riot in the streets, desecrating war memorials, defacing and destroying public monuments. And that the response of the government in these two cases seems to be a massive contrast uh, undermines the message which the government wants to convey. Uh, well, Shavis, I disagree with uh, the member, as he knows. Uh, I had the uh, very sad responsibility in my opening statement to refer to the 2,240 people who have so far lost their lives uh, in Wales. I don't regard that as a nut. Uh, I think that is demeaning. Uh, to those people and to those families and to those who carry on having that experience uh, every day and every week uh, in Wales. So I don't apologise for a single moment for the actions we have taken to prevent even further uh, deaths from coronavirus. Uh, I don't dismiss for a single moment the economic uh, damage that is being done and I'll need to attend to that uh, properly. But I don't agree with him. I've heard him say it before. He wants to create some sort of uh, division between what is right for people's health and what is right for the uh, economy. Uh, what is right for the economy is to make sure that we come out of coronavirus uh, in a cautious and careful way that does not plunge us back into a second wave with a further massive uh, lockdown and everything that that would mean uh, for the uh, economy. Our way of responding to the health crisis is the best way to safeguard our economy from the enormous impact that coronavirus is having here in Wales as it is 
right around uh, the world. Uh, let me just respond to one further point, that of uh, faith uh, communities. Uh, we raised the matter on the 29th of April in the Faith Communities Forum with leaders of faith community in Wales about the reopening of uh, venues for private prayer. Uh, at that point, the firm advice from leaders of those communities was that it wasn't practical for them to be able to reopen those venues in a way that is safe. Uh, I attended uh, the last meeting of the Faith Communities Forum last week. An enormous amount of work uh, has gone on uh, by those communities to put themselves in a position where they could now uh, potentially reopen venues for private uh, prayer. I was very impressed by all the practical things that they had thought about and were putting uh, into place. And we will consider that very seriously uh, as we move to the end of the current three-week cycle. Finally, Jack Sargent. Where did Jack Sargent go? He was there when I called him and he's disappeared off my screen and is not um, to be heard. Um, therefore, I'll call Mick Antoniv as the final speaker. First Minister, across all parties, we very much welcomed some weeks ago now the uh, £500 additional payment to be made to our frontline care workers in recognition of the extra contribution and the really important contribution they're making uh, during this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, and this was very much at the expense of £32 million of Welsh Government money for 64,000 of those workers. Uh, I wonder if you could perhaps update us now as to uh, two things. Firstly, uh, when those workers can expect to receive those uh, uh, payments. Uh, but secondly, uh, in respect of the issue of the tax and national insurance uh, that would be chargeable to it. Uh, I know that you reported previously that um, represent, representations had been made to the UK government to waive the tax and national insurance because of the exceptional circumstances. I think across all parties, we would see it as a, offensive if the UK government were to have a financial windfall on the backs of uh, our frontline care workers. Could you update us as to what the stage the representations are with the UK government with regard to uh, waiving uh, these uh, deductions from the money that is rightly due to our frontline care workers? Uh, thank you, McEntry, for that question. I was very pleased last week, Chloe, to be able to provide further details of how the scheme is to work and to be able to extend it to further groups uh, of workers. And we expect first payments to be made uh, in this month and to continue into next month. Uh, as far as uh, the tax and uh, national insurance position is concerned, uh, let me just echo what Mick Anton, you said. So we're not asking the UK government for a penny towards the 32 million that we have been able to find for this purpose. Uh, we're not asking them to pay for it. All we're asking them to do is not to take money away from uh, those uh, workers who we intend uh, to benefit from uh, the scheme. So there should be no Treasury windfall. Uh, we were discouraged by the letter we received on the 2nd of June uh, from the Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, but that letter did uh, contain an offer for officials to continue to work uh, together uh, on the proposition. And on Friday of last week, following what I was reported to me as a constructive uh, meeting, our officials did submit a technical paper uh, to HMRC presenting the arguments we make as to why these payments should not and need not uh, be taxable. Uh, so we will await uh, their response, which we hope will come as soon as possible. Uh, we're not at the end uh, of this discussion yet, and we will continue as vigorously as we can uh, to make the case that the money that's being provided by Welsh people to those people that we have relied on uh, for uh, such an enormous 
effort during the coronavirus crisis should not result in a windfall to the Treasury. As he's now back and as he's our youngest member, um, I'll finally call Jack Sargent. Uh, with, uh, and apologies for the earlier interruption. Um, First Minister, I've been working with a number of businesses um, who have been refused uh, insurance payments despite having paid for business interruption uh, insurance. Now, they are told because coronavirus is not previously a specified disease that they cannot claim. Now, most pe reasonable people, like I'm sure all members of the, the Senate are, would point out that COVID-19 has only existed since late last year. So it is very unlikely to be a specified disease. Now, I don't think this is good enough, um, First Minister. Large insurance, large insurance insurers who have been receiving payments from small businesses for a number of years are putting small businesses in all of our communities in real jeopardy. First Minister, will the Welsh Government investigate such cases as a matter of urgency? Uh, so I thank uh, Jack Sargent for that important uh, point. He, he will not be surprised to learn that we've had a volume of correspondence uh, on this matter from firms who believed that in good faith they had taken out insurance, uh, which would cover them in these circumstances, only to be told uh, that now it doesn't. And we've been in correspondence as ministers with the ABI, the Association of British Insurers, on this matter. Uh, Jack Sargent will know that the regulator has decided to take a test case uh, through the law courts to resolve this, uh, this very specific point uh, that he has raised. Uh, how could uh, insurance policies have been designed to cover an eventuality that nobody had identified? Uh, and can that really be cited as an exemption that means that payments can't be made? Uh, it's a, a standoff between the industry uh, and those of us who believe that they should have acted otherwise, and it will now be for the law courts to resolve it. Diolch i'r uh, prif weinidog, yr eitem nesaf oedd yr cwestiynau